All right, well, we're back for a second session on the chemistry of stormwater for industrial facilities. And I hope you enjoyed that first keynote session in which we laid a foundation about how chemistry is involved in stormwater runoff and water quality and what we do in the industrial general permit. Now, for the second session, we wanted to go a little more in depth. There are a lot of things that can be confusing when it comes to chemistry and what's required by the industrial general permit. There's a lot of misconceptions. Among those is BOD, COD. BOD standing for biological oxygen demand or sometimes called biochemical oxygen demand and COD, chemical oxygen demand. When do you use one versus the other? Uh, what do those two tests tell you? And so I've asked Griselda Martinez with McCampbell Analytical to join us once again to shed some light on some of these more complex issues. So why don't you come and join me with a, a conversation with her? What are those tests and how do they work together? So basically, um, the bottom line of both, both of those tests is to determine uh, the amount of oxidizable pollutants that are in the water. Uh, biological oxygen demand, it's called biological oxygen demand because it employs um, microbes um, to uh, test the um, oxidation of organics in the solution. Okay, so how is the test actually done? So they, they differ in the information that you're getting from it and also in the actual um, procedure to, of performing the test. So BOD, um, it's a five-day test, um, mm -hmm. so you can't get 24-hour turnaround times on a BOD, um, which uh, is going to actually, it's performed by, it's performed by uh, um, preparing a series of dilutions of the, of the uh, water with um, oxygen rich or um, oxygen fortified, dissolved oxygen fortified reagent water. Um, they're seeded with a microbe, with, mm -hmm. a, with a, some form of, um, of microorganisms that then um, are going to deplete the dissolved oxygen in the reagent water based off of the organic pollutants that are present. Okay, so I see you're actually using a living creature, in this case a bacteria mm -hmm. of some sort. That's right. To to oxidize. That's, that's correct. Because when we look at biochemistry, that's the chemical reactions within a living organism. That's right. So we're actually using some biochemistry to oxidize these <clears throat> pollutants of whatever they might be mm -hmm. to, to measure the demand that's of oxygen. Right. So the more food there is um, in the form of pollutants in the water, the more food there is for the bacteria. Um, the more they'll eat, and the more the, the more they eat, the more oxygen they're consuming in the process because it's done through an oxidative process. And, and what kind of food are we talking about? We're talking about, uh, for BOD, it's going to be, of course, biodegradable um, organics, uh, sugars, um, anything that'll, that'll biodegrade. Um, alcohols? Alcohols. Um, and maybe even some petroleum products? Yeah, some petroleum products, uh, for sure. Um, they, microorganisms do like um, carbon and hydrogen uh, based. Okay, molecules. so we're moving to organic chemistry, and when we're when we have BOD, the BOD analysis, we're using biological organisms, mm -hmm. bacteria, to to oxidize this. And then, what are we? What's our result? What are we actually measuring? So, what you're actually uh, measuring is um, the concentration, the estimated concentration of pollutants in your in your water by means of um, oxygen depletion. Okay. Now let's let's go to the other test that sounds very similar, but it's chemical oxygen demand COD. Mm -hmm. How how is that different than BOD? Well, the chemical oxygen demand um, it's done under much harsher um, conditions, which is why it's a chemical it's a chemical oxygen um, procedure. It uses a strong oxidant, um, concentrated acids, and that test is basically going to oxidize anything that's oxidizable, whether it's biodegradable or non-biodegradable or okay. inorganic. So um, for the most part, the relationship between the two tests is your COD is going to be higher than your BOD. Because it's, it's completely oxidizing everything because anything, it's using a very strong, very strong oxidizer oxid to do that. That's correct. Okay. 
So, so when would we might want to use a BOD test versus a COD test when it comes to stormwater runoff from our facility? Well, again, it's going to depend on the type of contaminants that you might have in the stormwater uh -huh. runoff. If they lend themselves to biological uh, degradation, then BOD might be appropriate. I'm thinking maybe like a agricultural runoff maybe or a runoff from like um, leaky sep uh, septic um, Okay. Um, uh, tanks or whatever um, versus the COD, it's probably more appropriate, I want to say, for maybe industrial facilities that might be using chemicals that aren't um, as biodegradable or they won't oxidize okay. as easily under, you know, microbial introduction or whatever. Okay, so let's say I'm a food processor. Maybe I make juices, bottle up juices or something, uh, and that is my pollutant. My mm -hmm. pollutant is apple juice. Mm -hmm. So would I be, uh, would it be most appropriate then maybe to select a BOD test as an indicator of those sugars being there? Yeah, you can uh, choose BOD uh, for the test. Now COD will also oxidize it. Will, it. it will also oxidize it, but it, if you're mostly interested in, in, in um, testing the biodegradation, the then the BOD is going to be. Because I could be oxidizing other things beyond my shirt, my apple juice. That's right. That may be not even related to my industrial facility. That's correct. And so I'm going to want to pick BOD if my pollutant of concern is something that's uh, naturally biodegradable. That's right. Okay. Oh, that helped me out a lot because I don't, I don't think a lot of people understand that. Mm -hmm. And then if, like you said, if I'm an industrial facility working with some pretty heavy duty chemicals, th but that are oxidizers, maybe them the, themselves, mm -hmm. then maybe I want to go with COD. That's right. To, 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 to measure the for the oxygen demand. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about that oxygen demand for a little bit. How does that relate to dissolved oxygen? Well, the dissolved oxygen, your, your, your water is going to have a, a specific amount of um, dissolved oxygen, and it's it's based on equilibrium right. um, relationships so, between yeah, the ambient air. Yeah, we even have some air. So here's our oxygen, and here's our water molecules. We're going to have some some oxygen. Of course, not in O2 form, right? It's going to be more uh, ionic. That's right. And uh, but it's in, it's in there, and living organisms need this. They do. That's why it's a water quality test. Mm -hmm. They need this mm -hmm. to to live. To live, yeah. And to produce, um, you know, reactions that they need for their... Um, but if I have big chemicals survival. like this wanting to gobble it up, then those living creatures can't live and so my, my, my dissolved oxygen's dropped. That's right. You'll create a hypoxic uh, environment that is, is toxic. Yeah, and, and therefore I would expect to have a high BOD or COD. Yep, that's right. Okay, so, so now why don't we just test for dissolved oxygen? Um, well, dissolved oxygen, it could be um, reduced by a number of um, other sources, too, that mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to do with uh, organic pollutants. And I understand it could also be artificially raised for a period of time, too. It can, depending on uh, the environmental conditions. So if we have a lot, some rough water where we're sampling and it's aerating, maybe getting to that sample point, then we could artificially raise up that uh, low, that dissolved oxygen level, but still have a pretty hefty BOD, COD. Mm -hmm. And once it sits, then it's going to gobble up that oxygen. That's right. So that's why maybe the BOD, COD test is... a more is, accurate test. And yes. more appropriate for an industrial facility. Okay, so um, when it comes to analyzing BOD or COD in the laboratory, what are some situations, maybe something that can happen in the way I sample or or what's happening in the field where the sample's being collected that could uh, affect your BOD, COD analysis in the laboratory. Is there anything that might be, we might need to think about? Um, I mean, homogeneity, of course, is important. Um, sampling from a specific point versus uh, another point might yield higher BOD or, or higher COD. So um, consistency in consistency sampling. Consistency in sampling, yeah. So mm -hmm. if you sampled it this in this spot, you know, two months ago, and then you're sampling it from a different spot, then they may not they may not be um, you know comparable. Right. Okay. Uh, so just to summarize this part, and then we'll move on to another misconception. 
if I'm getting a high BOD measurement, then I'm going to need to think that I might have sources that are acting as food sources for these microbes. for microbes. Mm -hmm. And so those types of things that we got a few products over here might be sugar or we got alcohol mm -hmm. uh, that might be causing that to be a problem. If I get a relatively low BOD mm -hmm. but a high COD, then I consume what? That they're, that they're pollutants that are um, oxidized under much harsher conditions, obviously, so they're not necessarily biodegradable um, pollutants. Okay, and that's why it's really important for uh, our viewers to, to understand that sometimes it's appropriate to run both, mm -hmm. especially if we're trying to figure out what is causing the problem, because running both could tell us whether it is a um, biodegradable source mm -hmm. or whether it's a non-biodegradable source and that might tell us where to look for our solutions to, right. to our low dissolved pro oxygen problems. Mm -hmm. All right, well let's move on to another big area of misconception, that's nutrients. Mm -hmm. Now that's a big category. When we say nutrients, what are we talking about? Mostly nitrogen and phosphate of course is a big nutrient, but um, nitrogen. And when I think of nutrient, I'm thinking of like you know, I eat food to be a nutrient. <laughs> <clears throat> Whose nutrients are we talking about? We're talking about plants oh. and um, organisms that live in the in the water that require nitrogen, fixed uh, fixed um, types of nitrogen in order to, um, you know, in order for their li life cycle to right to um, to thrive. And so it's nitrogen and phosphorus and. Uh, uh, things like that. But let's specifically look at nitrogen because that is a big area of misconception, especially mm -hmm. in the environmental um, stormwater field uh, because there's lots of different nitrogen tests I've noticed. The one that we see here on, on this table one, it, it says N plus N. What is that? <laughs> N plus N, um, I think that you're talking about nitrate, nitrite, right? Yes. There are the two forms of oxidized um, nitrogen um, that you typically analyze um, in combination. Um, but they are two different chemicals. They are chemicals. two different chemicals. They are two different chemicals. And you, you could do speciation tests on them um, that uh, you could use like ion chromatography uh, to, to mm -hmm. speciate them. But they are, yeah, they're two different chemicals, but yeah, they're because, often reported together. Yeah, in fact, the reason we they're reported together is because the state water board in their industrial general permit is saying you will give me N plus N, but then they add in another thing as as N or as nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Now, what's that about? And and I have seen reports reading these reports of nitrates and nitrites that sometimes will even be reported as nitrates. Mm -hmm. What is that about? So. The industry standard for uh, measuring nitrogen is as N, because uh, measuring it as N is gonna allow you to do a direct comparative between um, the available fixed nitrogen in the water that is interconvertible. So the nitrogen sources, um, ammonia, nitrate, nitrite, and organic nitrogen, they are biochemically interconvertible, okay? So um, when you measure uh, ammonia, for example, um, and you report it as N, then you're able to make a correlation between the nitrogen available as ammonia versus uh, the nitrogen available as the other as the other species. And is that because of the way the test is done? It's it's, it's um, counting nitrogen uh, molecules? Or well no right? it's not counting nitrogen molecules it might be counting of course the certain chemical reactions like um, well all the instrumentation is calibrated in concentration mm -hmm. units of nitrogen. Okay. So that's already embedded into the calculation when the when the results are produced. But it, it is measuring a, 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 the individual species. It, so. It's just standardizing, it's standardizing the reporting so that we have a standard to say, okay, this is as, as nitrogen. Now, what do they mean when it's reported as nitrate? When it's reported as nitrate, it's basically, you know, it's a stoichiometric calculation um, that is going to either, that's going to um, change uh, the actual concentration that's being reported yeah. by uh, the molecular weight ratio of nitrogen and the species that you're um, reporting it as. And that's a term I haven't heard since my college days, stoichiometric. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get too heavy. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. That, that has to do with the, the chemical equations, right? Chemical and equations the balancing and of them. The amount of uh, moles of nitrogen um, in, the, in the species compared to uh, 
uh, the amount of molten nitrogen you were you reported. Okay, so um, now there are, as you said, there are different forms of nitrogen. We have nitrates, we have nitrites, we have ammonia, mm -hmm. and uh, organic those, nitrogen. Okay, organic nitrogen. So the different forms. Now there is, I've seen a test called total nitrogen. And there's also this strange one. I, I don't know if I even know how to say it. It's TKN. That's what I call it. How do you say it? Total Kaldol nitrogen. Total Kaldol. I think. There's a J in there. That always messes there me up. There is a silent J. <laughs> yes. Yeah. What is it, Swedish or something? I have no idea. Yeah, I don't either. But That, oh, was, that wasn't on my sheet. Oh, it wasn't on your sheet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but total nitrogen... TKN, are those two different tests? Or is, T, is total nitrogen even a test? Is that more a there, calculation? Well, you, you can test it directly. There, is a, uh, there are um, some tests where it could be directly measured, um, but it could also be the sum of the individual, the other ni nitrogen constituents that were so tested. So nitrate, nitrite, nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, ammonia, and organic um, nitrogen. nitrogen. And we add all those up. We run the tests separately, we add them up, and yep. that's, total that's total nitrogen. That's nitrogen, that's right. And the total uh, Keldol nitrogen is um, the combined results of ammonia and organic nitrogen. And they're combined because the organic nitrogen um, is, um, or the, the sources of organic nitrogen are digested harshly with um, concentrated acid, which is going to pop off the, the nitrogen um, from the organic compound. And um, the mode of detection for that nitrogen that's been popped off is ammonia. Okay, well, so I think I'm learning something here. If I have a industrial facility where I know there's nitrates, but it, I know it's also not industrial related, mm -hmm. uh, but I have ammonia sources, mm -hmm. then maybe TKN might be the mo more appropriate because it sounds like to me it's leaving out the other forms, nitrate and nitrite. That's right. Oh. So, so TKN is leaving out nitrate and nitrite. So if I know nitrate and nitrite are there, I'm not going to want to pick total nitrogen. No, because you'll sum, you'll, it'll be the sum of all of those constituents. But if, they, if I know they're there and I know they're not a part of our industrial process, then I'll pick TKN because that will give me my best picture of what my industrial process is doing to storm water. That's right. Well, very good. Very good. So um, now when we're sampling for these nitrogen-containing compounds, are there things we need to be thinking about in the field as how we collect them? Um, is there things that could mess it up for the laboratory? Yeah, um, one thing about sampling uh, for ammonia, of course ammonia at uh, high pH is, um, is volatile and it's, and it's toxic, so you want to make sure that you're collecting in the correct um, containers for sure. And um, of course homogeneity and sampling points and consistency also play a part. Okay, and do these compounds readily dissolve in water? They, they do dissolve in water. Okay. So. So, so it's going to be in a um, polar situation, and uh, and they're definitely readily going to go into solution, and, mm -hmm. and hence that's why they're uh, in uh, concern. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what can cause problems for the laboratory with a, uh, a sample poorly collected? Can can we? Um, mask it somehow or cause interference? Uh, yeah, um, you want to try to avoid um, sampling uh, the samples when the, I mean I know it's sometimes you can't really control uh, when you're when you're um, sampling for storm water runoff but high turbidity um, might be an issue because these tests are done colorimetrically which means they're, re they're relying oh. on, a, on a color change of a chemical reaction that's taking place and it might be you know uh, it might cause interferences. So, so if I have very turbid water, which is also a problem with the industrial general permit, something we're going to want to address, mm -hmm. that could cause me problems with my nitrogen then. If it's not, you know, treated um, okay. before it's... And uh, obviously we're going to want to treat it because we're going to have high TSS most likely. Exactly. Um, all right, so the types of facilities that might need to do this, uh, where we start first off is, is table one. Table one in the industrial general permit actually says, if you're this type of facility, you will be doing N plus N. Uh, that's most of the facilities. So looking here, copper ores, fats and oils uh, might have to be doing that. There's even some things that we wouldn't typically think of, like the metal industry has to do nitrate plus nitrate, nitrite, 
because I guess in the process of smelting, there, there's a nitrification process that can introduce that mm -hmm. to it. Uh, other things would be, um, we have some products here. Uh, we have uh, fertilizers, that big bag out front. So if you're, I mean, that's what we're talking about, nutrients, right? Yep. And so fertilizer, ag companies are going to naturally be dealing with forms of nitrogen. That's right. Okay. And uh, the, of course, part of the reasons is, um, you know, when you um, introduce um, high concentrations of uh, fertilizers or agricultural runoff, um, you're going to have an explosion because they're fortified with nutrients that are, that are required for the plants to grow, for their crops to grow or whatever. You're going to have an explosion of plant growth in the, in the receiving water. Yeah. So that's why we're doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we send that off and that's going to create a chain effect of other things. Uh, it's going to gobble up oxygen. That's right. So now we've got a BOD, COD issue going exactly. on. Exactly. You have a TSS issue going on. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention, you know, some algae produce uh, cyanotoxins, which are pretty, pretty nasty stuff, too. So. so, wow. Okay. Well, let's move on to our next area of misconception, and that would be uh, solids. About uh, solids. We, we mentioned... I think earlier in the first segment that there are three basic tests that the industrial general permit requires of everybody. And that's oil and grease, pH, but then total suspended solids. Mm -hmm. And as I go down and look at the types of tests that are, um, that a laboratory might do for solids, I notice there's a lot of different things that are done. Not to mention we were just talking about turbidity. Mm -hmm. So could you help us understand um, this, how do we test for solids? And what's the pros and cons of different tests that we might select? So, so maybe walk through the different types of solid tests that a laboratory would do. Sure. Um, solids are, are gonna be, in general, in, in three forms. They're either gonna be settled at the bottom of um, an aqueous solution, they're gonna be completely dissolved um, in the aqueous solution, or they're gonna be suspended um, in an aqueous solution or an aqueous sample, sorry. Um, so depending on what you're trying to measure, you're mm -hmm. going to perform a specific test. If you're trying to measure total suspended solids, which are going to be, you know, uh, particles floating in, this, in the water that are not going to settle, um, causing turbidity issues. Or at least not settle in any time soon. Any not, time soon or without, without, without the yeah. help of some type of flocculating yeah. agent or something. Um, then what you would do is you um, take a known amount of um, or a specific volume of sample, you filter it uh, with a filtering apparatus, collect it on a, on a pre-weighed um, glass fiber filter, um, two micrometer, you know, mm -hmm. size or, or, or smaller, but I think two micrometers is probably the industry standard. Um, and then um, whatever's caught on that filter uh, is going to be dried and reweighed. And okay. your total suspended uh, solids is a gravimetric determination of the weight of the suspended solids um, over the volume. So you got a known volume, and you come up with a weight, mm -hmm. and you can come up with a concentration that's then, right. you can milligrams come up with per uh, liter. Milligrams per liter of dry weight. Um, TDS, uh, total dissolved solids, as the name implies, um, is measuring the gravimetrically, it's also gravimetric determination. Um, how much solids are, you know, the amount of dissolved solids that there are in the, in the water. In other words, what went into solution? What went into solution. And that would include things like salts? It would include things like salts, um, dissolved organic um, sugar material as well, sugar, um, things yeah. that aren't necessarily going to be very conductive. Um, so maybe alcohols, alcohols uh, acetone. Or, yeah, as long as they're as but long as they're not going to volatilize at the drying temperature. Okay. Um, but it's got to um, be something that actually it's usually a salt type of thing. It's usually a salt type of thing. Yes, type of particulate. Okay, so um, we got suspended, and then we got uh, dissolved, mm -hmm. and then we have settable. settable. In fact, I have right there. Yeah, uh, you, you want to grab one of those I'm off? Sure. Sorry. I think we call them I'm offs, right? You know, I'm not sure exactly what they're called. But T S T T a total a settable solid sampling. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do with these? So basically, you um, introduce a, a specific amount of volume. It looks like this is a liter. You can introduce up to a liter on here, and you will not. And this has to be done at room temperature. Um, so you kind of let it sit, and I'm not 100% sure how long 
you're supposed to let it sit for. I think it's an hour if I remember right. Maybe an hour, um, but at the end of the test, you're gonna have uh, an amount of um, sediment collected at the bottom of this, of this tip here. And it's made this way so that you, you have these tiny little graduation lines down here that'll elect, that will allow you to measure um, small amounts of sediment. Okay, so. down to I think 0.1 uh, milliliters per liter. So it's a volumetric measurement. It's a volumetric uh, measurement, that's right. So you're going to have um, and it's volume important per volume. Because in the construction, I know today we're talking about industrial, but construction mm -hmm. uh, projects a lot of times are under water quality certification um, requirements where they have to test downstream and test for settable solids. Settable solids isn't used a whole lot in the industrial area, uh, more TSS. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to TSS, just total suspended solids. You had mentioned that you have this, this uh, filter that we're, we're passing the water through, capturing it, weighing it. Now can some particles get through that? Some particles can get through that. Anything that's smaller than the size of the... Of like the, you think you said two micron? Two micron, yeah. Well, clay particles are down to, I think, 0.1 so, or yeah, smaller. Those will, those will actually pass through the filter then and they won't be detected as a TSS. So that is presumably why another solids test was developed and that is turbidity. Mm -hmm. How is turbidity different? So turbidity is actually measuring the effects of the suspended solids. Um, it's, a, it's a test that um, is measuring the way that the light is being absorbed or scattered into an aqueous sample. So it's more the result of uh, total suspended solids. Okay, so we would be potentially capturing things that would not be captured in the TSS, especially if we had sites that had either clay or silts, mm -hmm. fine silts present. Now, on Friday, we're going to talk about construction. Today, we're talking more industrial. But it could happen at an industrial facility if they have a lot of open dirt spaces mm -hmm. where they got a lot of traffic. And that, if that sure. soil is more a clay nature, then we might have... Maybe wash it up. Mm -hmm. We might have low TSS, but we With might still have really muddy water going off site. Yep. And that's because it's blown right through the TSS. Mm -hmm. Although there is a correlation between the TSS and the uh, turbidity though, so if you have a high TSS content, then your turbidity is going to be is going to be high. Yes, yes. But you can have a situation have, where you have high turbidity, right. but your TSS it's is low. relatively low. And it's, yeah, it's going to depend on the size of the particles. Okay, and so the stormwater professional needs to understand the limitations of different tests mm -hmm. and how the test is actually done. And that's why we brought you in here to talk to them, mm -hmm. because you need to know that, that the way the TSS sample is being done is certain pollutants might be going right through that. and it, and you may still be sending out a muddy plume out into the receiving water, even with acceptable numeric action TSS levels points. for TSS. Yeah, right. Very good. So when I'm thinking about uh, sending samples to the laboratory, or even let's start in collecting samples, is it important how I pay attention to how I collect my so solid samples? I know next hour we're gonna talk a lot more okay, about, yeah. so we don't wanna get too in depth on, <laughs> in proper sample management. Mm -hmm. But I imagine there's things that I can do in the field to give you a sample that messes the laboratory up. Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're sampling um, from a source that has uh, different particle sizes, sometimes you have um, forms of in inhomogeneity in the sample, meaning if I, if I have to um, filter a sample that has high, high particles in it, I might clog my filter or I'll have to work around having uh, the different particle sizes, so okay. keep that into consideration, I guess. Okay. And so um, the reason why this is required of all sites is presumably every site has the potential to have uh, suspended particles, suspended sediment in their stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. and, and so literally all industrial facilities have to do that. And Aaron shared last hour that the way to counteract that is just good housekeeping. Good housekeeping. Staying on top of your of your of your mess. All right, let's talk about another one. I know last hour we touched base on this, organics, um, and uh, we we started the conversation about VOCs and SVOCs. But I'd really like to go a little more in depth. Mm -hmm. um, 
because there are lots of different tests that your laboratory does and all laboratories do that that um, that relate to organic chemistry but help us to understand some of these so first off there's oil and grease that's one of the basic threes in that oil and grease test what are we really looking at so oil and grease um, is also referred to as hem hexane extractable material and when you think about oil and grease you're thinking about things that are of either like um, um, fatty material that we eat or petroleum based um, oils, um, things of that nature, but the hexane solvent that's used in the sample prep, in the, in the extraction process, it will co-extract anything that will dissolve into it. So it's a polar, or a non-polar, it's a non-polar non -polar solvent. solvent. That's right, that will... Water's polar, this is non-polar, just like in the shop we might use a distilled spirits or mineral spirits to, to do our paintbrush. That's, that's right, yeah. So uh, hexane is a nonpolar solvent that will um, pull anything that um, is nonpolar to a certain degree um, into it. So. Okay, so the types of things would be greases, oils? Greases, oils, but also uh, phthalates, uh, plasticizers will, will, will go in there too, um, chlorinated pesticides. Okay. Um, so, so it is a wide spectrum of things that we're boiling down to a single number. That's right. And that's what a lot of people need to understand. The main difference between like VOCs and oil and greases. One's specific versus the other one is more a, a, a general test. A wide spectrum. Now, like um, one of the things that we see is um, in the industrial general permit, we of course have the mandatory test, either the, the three basics, oil and grease, pH, and TSS, or we have SIC code driven things uh, that are called out like N plus N, we talked about that. But then there's this other category that we have to test for indicators of pollutants that might be there. Now, one of the things we've struggled with, a lot of uh, SWIP writers have struggled with is, can oil and grease, the oil and grease analysis be an indicator of things like gasoline or diesel? Well, oil and grease is going to be limited um, for the determination of gasoline because um, gasoline has volatile constituents in it. Benzene, um, mm. ethyl benzene, toluene, these things. Um, and because the test requires the hexane solvent to be evaporated and the residue is what's weighed and, and mm. quantitated, um, anything that's volatile like um, we're going to lose those. You're going to lose those to volatilization, um, like like petroleum distillates, gasoline being one of them, um, mineral spirits. So it's possible it won't be detected at all. It's possible it won't de be detected at all if it's at a at a low enough concentration. What about like diesel? It's less volatile. Yeah, diesel's less volatile, and that um, that could will be uh, determined by okay. an oil and grease analysis. But there's other tests that the laboratory does that are still broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. Uh, not specific to a particular thing like benzene or toluene. Mm -hmm. What are some of those? Well, we do test for uh, different uh, fuel analyses, like um, if you're looking for gasoline specifically, um, we can test for gasoline range organics. If you're testing for diesel specifically, we test for diesel range organics. Is that what's called the total petroleum hydrocarbons total test, TPH? Well, it's not going to, well, total petroleum hydrocarbons you're going to have to treat um, any material that's not a total that's not of petroleum content, um, because even with the GCFID, which is used for like multi-range analysis of gasoline mm -hmm. and and, um, and diesel, you will still have uh, things showing up in your test that aren't necessarily petroleum. Oh, based. could be plant-based. Exactly, it could be plant-based. So the way that um, the analysis is, is taking place to, to speciate specifically total petroleum hydrocarbons is that um, they have what's called a silica gel treatment. Oh. Now the silica gels is, is a polar material that will interact and adhere the polar groups of uh, non-petroleum um, materials. So, so smaller or larger chain carbon structures or how's it know? Well it knows by the, the polarity of the compound. Okay. So it, it doesn't, I mean, the length of the, the chain, the length of the chain, of course, is is, um, is of, of the essence too. The longer the chain, the less polar that uh, the compound's gonna be, but it's really gonna depend mm -hmm. on its ability to adhere to the to the polar material. So let's say I have an industrial site that has maybe a fueling station, gasoline and diesel. Mm -hmm. 
but this site is surrounded by eucalyptus trees and I got lots of dead eucalyptus leaves on the ground mm -hmm. at the fence lines where I sample. Could that affect a, a one of these analyses? It can because um, if you're not uh, looking for petroleum specifically and you don't silica gel treat it, you'll have um, material that's going to be counted. Um, so you could get a false positive. You could get a false positive. Or, a, or it's saying there's organics there, but it's identifying the leaves, that the material that comes That's from right. the, the eucalyptus. Right. And because the uh, gasoline, the DRO, GRO, and oil and grease is a, is a combined um, analysis of anything that falls inside of its parameters, then you could get false, false readings. So would you say then if I know what kind of pollu uh, potential pollutant I have on site, let's just say it's diesel or gasoline, mm -hmm. would I be best served by maybe doing a uh, VOC or an SVOC? Yes. Definitely. And why is that? Because it's going to be more specific to the, uh, to the contaminant that you're looking for. In other words, if I see BTEX, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, xylene, mm -hmm. show up in mm -hmm. my sample, then I could be pretty sure that I have a gasoline they influence. Are, they're, those are indicators. It's not my gasoline. eucalyptus trees. It's not the eucalyptus, no. <laughs> okay. So, so that is, uh, if, if we know exactly what the source is, if we don't know the source, then maybe we're better adding in a broader spectrum. A broader spectrum, yes. To, so. to at least uh, to maybe help us in our, our isolating the mm -hmm. source? It's more of a categorical um, examination versus a, a targeted. Okay. Now I noticed that the laboratory has different numbers. You call them method numbers. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to VOCs and SVOCs. There's the 624, 625s that we see called out sometimes. And then other times we see an 8260, 8270. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? So the methods, um, as far as how the samples are prepared, as far as how the samples are collected and preserved, as far as the instrumentation that's used uh, to analyze um, the samples, um, they're basically the same. But um, the quality control measures associated with each test are going to change depending on what the industry, you know, what, it, what its applicability is. So those are referring to standards, standards that have been set by the industry, the EPA, the EPA right. and mm -hmm. approved by the EPA approved or by, by the EPA. state of California. Yep. And it's a protocol. It's, it's saying it's, you, when you do this test, you will do it exactly. this way. Exactly. If you're testing for 82, for the 8000 series, your daily calibration verification must be within this range yeah. versus the six, uh, the 600 series from, from um, our experience is a little bit more more relaxed. So I've un from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the 624, 625 is more appropriate for like stormwater, where I've heard the 8260, 8270 is more like hazardous waste or or, well, or that type of the thing. The 600 series are actually for hazardous waste. Um, oh, did I get that backwards? Or is it, no, the, the other way? Oh. <laughs> Volatiles are volatile. Yes. But, um, yeah, and I one, know I'm one putting is, you on one the is spot here. One is applicable. So 624, um, 625 is water. It, they're, they're both water. Um, so is 8,000, though. But 8,000 do, does um, speak to other matrices as well that aren't necessarily aqueous, like oils. and. But it also speaks to, uh, to um, groundwater and surface water, Okay. Um, which are not particularly mentioned in the 600 series. And I guess what we need to say, and we're going to talk a lot more about this in the next hour, mm -hmm. but even if you got the wrong one, 8260 versus 624, it's not the end of the world. Nope. It's still going to give you a good analysis. That's right. Uh, but we're going to talk in the next hour the importance of filling out your COC correctly. And yes. Matrix is important. Is, is important it, because it'll it tell the analyst to handle it. what you should test for. That's right. And so you look at your or standards. The, the preparation of the, of the sample itself. Right. You look at your established protocols and it says, all right, I got stormwater. I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, very, very good. Now, are there problems that uh, can happen in the field to mess up an organics test? Yes, uh, absolutely. Of course, so we were talking about the uh, VOAs, for example, um, and not filling them up correctly or trying to split samples between um, SVOCs and VOCs. Um, so um, collecting in the appropriate containers and the correct volumes, too. Um, the reporting limits that um, our lab has published are based on uh, the sample containers that are given out. So right. if you're testing for 625, for example, and you're given a liter container, do your best to, to fill up the liter um, because your reporting limits are okay. might change if the preparation factor changes. 
All right. Well, very good. Well, Griselda, I appreciate this. This has certainly helped clarify some things, even f for me. I, I learned um, I'm walking away with some some knowledge, especially the importance of understanding what the laboratory is doing, because oftentimes we take it for granted. We just fill out the COC, we look at the, the permit, we know what to put down. But if we don't really understand some of the, the some nuances processes. you told us yeah. about, I might be missing opportunities to be able to do some detective work on my end as a consultant mm -hmm. to be able to go, well, well, maybe I got a source that I haven't considered. Maybe my source is, is a something that biodegrades versus versus the other. So mm -hmm. I appreciate your time thank you. and coming in here. And thank you for joining us for this segment of Stormwater Awareness Week. We're gonna continue with one more segment. We, we didn't want McCampbell Analytical to get away from us. We got one more really important segment and that is how to give the laboratory the best opportunity to give us good, reliable data. And so we're gonna be talking about sample management, sample techniques, and Join us for the next segment.